Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome. My name's Nick Spencer. I'm Senior Fellow at Theos. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the 12th Annual Theos Lecture. Now, I'm told there is an exhibition of Peruvian dance next door, and a few people may have inadvertently wandered in here by mistake. If you have, I fear you may be disappointed, but you can creep out quietly and no one will notice. In the unlikely event that there is an evacuation, as I'm mandated to say at the beginning of these things, please follow King's Place staff who will be wearing high-vis jackets and will lead you on to safety and salvation. Theos was launched 13 years ago with the support of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, though we are independent of any particular Christian denomination or political party. As it happens, we were launched a month after Richard Dawkins' best-selling God Delusion was published. Fellow Dawkins watchers will know that this year, the venerable professor is still going strong and has published a son of God delusion called Outgrowing God, in which he continues to argue that religion is outdated, irrelevant, and dangerous. The race is on to see which of us blinks first, Dawkins or Theos. All the smart money is on Dawkins. We're here to tell a better story about faith in general and Christianity in particular, better in the sense of more accurate, but also in the sense of more positive. We publish essays, reports, books, host debates, conduct media work, and talk to people like Russell Brand. If you want to hear more about that one, come and speak to us afterwards. We do that because we firmly believe that religion matters. The confident prediction of sociologists two generations ago that we are heading to a world in which religion is insignificant if it exists at all has been proved comprehensively wrong. God is back, the title of one famous book put it. However, God being back is not necessarily a good thing. As the rise of European Christian populism over recent years shows, Religious ideas and symbols and practices can be used and abused for no end of nefarious purposes. Society abhors a religious vacuum, and if there isn't intelligent and thoughtful discussion of religious ideas and commitments, we'll get the opposite. This is why at the heart of the work we do at Theos lies serious research into a whole range of issues, such as social cohesion, debt, free speech, all of which are the subject of recent Theos reports, and at the same time, serious, open, and we hope friendly discussion with some of the best thinkers of the day. Over the years, we've had a number of eminent annual lecturers from the world of arts, politics, law, such as Mark Thompson, Anora O'Neill, and the novelist Marilyn Robinson. More recently, we've had several prominent political figures, both of whom were excellent. However, I don't know where you are here, we were beginning to pick up a vague sense of people being a bit satiated with politics. Wondering what else we should do, a member of the team remembered having watched Sally Phillips' brilliant BBC documentary, A World Without Down Syndrome, question mark, and wondered whether we might explore this topic for our annual lecture this year. The subject of human identity and human dignity has run underneath much of our work, occasionally popping up explicitly such as in a report we did on the way that the word dignity was used in the assisted dying debate, in our work on the distinctive contribution that Catholic charities make to the common good, and in our ongoing work on science and religion in the UK. We'd never worked specifically on disability, and so we wondered if Sally would deliver a lecture for us. Elizabeth approached her, we held our breath, she agreed, and we are delighted to be hosting her tonight. And it seems also the Lord was on our side for this matter too, because he then went and engineered a general election, which meant that even if we had wanted to host another political lecture, we couldn't have done so. Mysterious ways, eh? Sally Phillips will be familiar to very many of you. 
an award-winning comic actress and writer. She was part of the team behind Channel 4 Smack the Pony and has appeared in numerous TV programs, including Miranda and Skins. On the radio, she plays the eponymous character Claire in the Radio 4's award-winning sitcom Claire and the Community. And in film, she's been in Bridget Jones's Diary, Birthday Girl with Nicole Kidman, and in the 2004 satiric film Churchill, The Hollywood Years. Last but certainly not least, as mentioned, she presented the BBC documentary A World Without Down Syndrome in 2016. We are very grateful that Sally's with us tonight. For six of our annual lectures now, we've been hugely grateful also to be working in partnership with CCLA, who have proved to be generous, thoughtful, and thoroughly engaged partners. For those of you who don't know them, CCLA are one of the UK's leading charity fund managers. They were set up over 50 years ago to serve the interests of mission-driven organisations who were frankly not well served by the financial services industry. And today they have over 40,000 churches, charities and public sector clients. They provide the secretariat for the Churches Investor Group, which represents institutional investors for many of the major churches. And they're ranked top manager of social and responsible investment funds in the UK. It's been a terrific partnership for us and one we are incredibly grateful for. It's also one that's seen progress. Last year's lecture, some of you will remember, was from Michael Gove on climate change and the environment. So I was particularly pleased to hear then two, that um, two of CCLA's ethical funds have just gone entirely fossil free. The person who mentioned this to me also mentioned that when CCLA started partnering with Theos, Six years ago, they managed around £5 billion, and today it's over £10 billion. So if anyone has any doubts about the benefits of working with Theos, go and talk to CCLA. Sally will deliver tonight's lecture, and then Elizabeth Oldfield, the director of Theos and the host of the Sacred Podcast, will be in conversation with her and chair questions from the floor. Tonight's event is being live-streamed and recorded, and if you'd like to tweet, please do so, and tag at Theos Think Tank while you do so. The topic of the lecture, as you know, is human dignity, different lives, and the illusion of choice. When we talk about this issue, there is a perennial danger that one group of people talks on behalf of another group. Almost always with the best of intentions, of course, but nevertheless exercising their voice and their agency on behalf of others. We were acutely conscious of this, and so working with Sally, we've invited the actor Tommy Jessup to open our evening with a soliloquy. Sally has worked with Tommy several times and in their shared craft, and we're very grateful to have him here tonight. As with Sally, Tommy will be known to many of you from his TV work, having appeared in Casualty, Monroe, Doctors, and Line of Duty. And in 2007, he starred in the feature-length BBC drama Coming Down the Mountain, which was nominated for a television BAFTA award, and he went on to win the Radar People of the Year Human Rights Media Award the following year. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Tommy Jessup. And 
then I pray you all that what so so ever else shall happen tonight you look through um, um, our sad performance and see that we are fools of, of, of nature, our wondrous tomb. What a piece of work is a man and woman. How noble in reason. How infinite in the form the um, 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 beauty of the world. We are all the same. The rest is silence. Thank you so much, Tommy. Good evening, everybody. My name is Sally Phillips, and I have attended not one, not two, but three different clown schools. First rule of clown school. Nobody talks about clown school. Second rule of clown school. The clown always says yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Led me into quite a few difficult situations <laughs> in the past. And, uh, but this perhaps... Anyway, the clown <laughs> always says yes because it is believed, and I believe this also to be true, that our ridiculous, naked, awful, lovely humanity is best revealed when we are really, truly out of our depths and trying to style it out. That moment when we stand on the chair and reach for the biscuit tin on a high shelf and miss and fall into the bin. As I said, my name is Sally Phillips, and tonight I shall be performing my one-woman Muppet Christmas Carol. No, <laughs> no sorry, it's the wrong night. <laughs> I shall be speaking to you tonight about, uh, what does it say, human dignity, different lives, and the illusion of choice. 
And I'm going to begin this story at the very beginning, the beginning of uh, the story that started the journey that has led me here, with the birth of my son, Oliver, who has Down syndrome. It was August 2004. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. Uh, the moment of diagnosis, 10 days after his birth, the doctor said, I'm sorry, and the midwife cried. Uh, we got Ollie home. He wasn't feeding very well. My mother was weeping in a corner going, we'll get him there. Somehow we'll get him to walk. We'll get him to walk. My brother James was incredibly kind. He was there, and he said, don't, for goodness sake, go on the internet. Uh, <laughs> but my friends and my family gathered round. Uh, I keep thinking of there is another country I've heard of, heard of long ago. It felt like we were the tiniest country in the world inside the walls of our top floor flat in Swiss Cottage. My father used to only let people in who he said had a visa, like having a visa. My brothers paid, uh, played team tag coming in and out. My friend Jess, who's in the front row here, turned up as she has done in the middle of every single challenge in my life with Oliver's Army on CD. She said, don't worry about it. She said, we lesbians know what it's like to be an outsider. The lesbians will have his back. <laughs> and she wasn't lying. There is a platoon of lesbians <laughs> ready to come and support Ollie through every single challenge he will encounter. And I would, there's no army I'd rather have with me. My friend Di, who again has been there, stayed up all night trying to feed Ollie 30 milligrams of express milk. Harry Enfield, who I had done a film with but barely knew, honestly, turned up at the front door with a, a, what looked like a you know, briefcase. And inside that was a hospital expresser that he had rented himself from behind John Lewis on Oxford Street. And he said, oh, I love Down syndrome babies. Turned up with this expresser and said, um, yeah, you might, might need this. And totally, totally transformed feeding Ollie. And um, when I went to pay for it six months later, he, he had covered the bill. So I was milked by Stavros. <laughs> kind of kind of weird. Um, I remember my husband was uh, just in, in shock, standing with his back to the room, washing up at the sink for about three months. That was another silver lining. Um, <laughs> but we did all react as if it was a, a terrible tragedy. The representative from our church who turned up sat, sat wordlessly on the sofa. I remember serving him lots of sugary tea for his shock. <laughs> the NHS had offered termination to birth uh, backpedal the moment your child's born. It's called the twice told tale. And they said he was just a perfectly normal baby and didn't need any assistance whatsoever. Um, people ran up to us in the street. They gave us, the, has anyone seen that thing, Holland? It's like a, yeah, it says, don't give that to people. It's a, um, a thing where it says, oh, you're booked to go on holiday to Italy and you've waited your whole life to go to Italy, but your plane's diverted to Holland and you got it. <laughs> Um, but after a while in Holland, for some reason you can't leave in, in, this, in this thing. Uh, for after a while in Holland, you realize that it's got things that are appealing, like, I don't know, <laughs> sex shops. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that... Uh, really, nobody said anything terribly positive. The, the feeling was that this was going to ruin our life. Apart from a Jewish couple in our NCT group, Vicky who had an absolutely legendary milk flow. She could feed her baby from across the room. She said, you know, in our culture, we call babies with Down syndrome mitzvahs. Mitzvah means a blessing. So as I said, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was what uh, theologians call a kairos moment. Kairos means a crisis, but I get the feeling it means crisis with hope, does it? I can see. We've got some clever people here. Brendan, is that what it means? Kairos? Crisis with a bit of hope thrown in. Not in Irish. <laughs> yes. So ki Kairos moments are completely, uh, you know, democratic. They happen to everybody. They happen to rich and poor, black and white, um, disabled and able-bodied. I think it, 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 um, even our dog, Teddy, has had a bit of a Kairos moment after swallowing a pepperoni wrapper. Necessita necessitating thousands of pounds worth of vet's treatment. He's, he is a changed dog. <laughs> he's not wiser. <laughs> but he's, you know, he's different, humbler. <laughs> a Kairos moment is basically a scene change in your life where the lights go out and um, it feels like your world has collapsed around you. 
And really, there's nothing to do in these moments apart from just to sit there and wait for the lights to come back on again when they will illuminate an entirely different and unfamiliar set for the next act of your life. The lights came on for me about nine months after Ollie's birth. I was on the bus with, uh, there were some other mothers on the bus. I had Ollie in a sling. I'd spent the morning trying to sw swing him around our flat on a hand towel, trying to teach him how to crawl, because you have to teach everything, as Jane knows. You have to do a little helping hand with everything. We'd had a real laugh. Ollie had been really killing himself laughing, and so had I, and it'd been a hilarious disaster and lots of fun. And on the bus, I heard these mothers complaining, going, oh, he's into everything, keeps me up all night, such a pain, he eats everything, won't eat anything, and... And I just had this uh, flash of, I think I'm enjoying this an awful lot more than they are. And that was the beginning of uh, beginning to understand what, again, theologians refer to as the topsy-turvy topology of the kingdom of God, where I just think we're particularly bad at knowing what are advantages and what are disadvantages. And these Kairos moments uh, can act as Rosetta Stones that teach us to properly or to better understand what's actually happening. Um, but at that point, it didn't really make any sense that I would think that my life was better, because we all knew my life was much, much worse. It was basically ruined. I was never going to be able to leave my home again or work again. And um, yeah, I was going to have a terrible life of deprivation and, and miser miserableness. Because in a hyper-competitive hyper culture in which even baking a cake is a fight almost to the death, I'm thinking of Bake Off, Ollie, of course, falls well short of the mark. The absolute of joy does issue a challenge to us. What then does it mean to live a fulfilled life, to be fully human? Stephen Unwin, a playwright and uh, uh, academic, calls learning disability the last socially acceptable prejudice, which does seem a tiny bit punchy, really until you begin to look at how very difficult a place the UK is for people with learning difficulties. And I'm just going to skid through the stats, because I know people don't really take them in, but I'll just give you a few examples. People with learning disabilities are hit throughout their lives by very unjust governmental policies. You, we can begin, you know, they don't have the same right to life as everybody else, whereas a, a child without disabilities, uh, the termination... Um, Cut-off is 24 weeks. If you have any form of disability, obviously includes Down syndrome and also inclu includes cleft palate and hair lip, you can be terminated up to and including labour. Um, uh, it's my view that uh, people with uh, people carrying Down syndrome pregnancies are kind of encouraged to terminate by the machinery of screening. It's called pathway dependency. Um, while abortion providers have successfully campaigned for and won increased care for women choosing termination, there's still no care pathway provided for women choosing to, uh, choosing to continue a Down syndrome pregnancy. You're, you're basically left, uh, left on your own. Um, there's the expensive new screen you've probably heard about that's been rolled out on the NHS at the cost of around £400 per woman. Um, this has been thought to be worth the money, even though um, there's... Actually, just this week, um, they were uh, the Advertising Standards Authority um, has said that, that this test has been missold. So they've overstated the benefits. When you look at the genuine benefits, and there is someone in the audience who will be able to tell you later. Colette Lloyd, could you put your hand up? If you're interested in stats, we call Colette Stato. She's got all the stats on this. Anyone who actually wants to know, I, I won't say them now because they're... Sorry, Colette, they're, bo they're boring. <laughs> <laughs> But basically, t you can take Colette's word for it that this test has been horribly oversold. The benefits have been enormously exaggerated. There is really only a very tiny benefit to the public. And yet, in time of austerity, the government has thought it's worthwhile to roll this out at the cost of £400 uh, pounds, uh, per woman. Um, what the result of rolling that test out is that um, uh, in places where it's out already, we think that the birth rate, Down syndrome birth rate, has gone down 30%. We knew this was going to happen. I think the manufacturers knew it was going to happen. Government knew it was going to happen, but they simply didn't care. Um, if you, if you uh, compare that with, if you're screening for race, say, or sexuality, um, there would be an enormous outcry. But this has gone for absolutely nothing, really. This has been the barest blip, barely covered in the papers. Why does it matter if, there's a, if uh, the Down syndrome population is reduced? 
I think lots of reasons. Um, obviously, for us, it means there's fewer friends um, and potential wives from our children. It also means there's less uh, incentive to invest in education and, and improved healthcare and job op opportunities and the specific kind of support that our people need. I also think that it is a sad indictment of society where the things that people with Down syndrome offer are not valued, can be thrown away so easily. People with Down syndrome are happy with their lives, they're being healthier, they're living longer, they're getting jobs. They're Tommy's won an Emmy, I think. He was certainly nominated for an Emmy. Emmy. Um, all the studies show that uh, families love their Down syndrome member, that people with Down syndrome are happy with their lives, that siblings are ha happy and love their family member, and that they're ever so the only difference between siblings of people with special needs and without is that those siblings are more likely to go on to have jobs that are beneficial to society. So to become nurses and doctors and psychotherapists and things like that. Um, yet, yet, um, Matt Hancock two weeks ago announced with glee that he's very excited about a future in which we will prenatally genome sequence every fetus to identify more and more differences. If Down syndrome is the canary in the mine, as it's being called, uh, initially called that by um, Professor Tom Shakespeare in the 90s, who then in our world will be welcome? Although nobody wants to be called eugenic, if individuals now are made within a system and in a context which is biased and overwhelmingly carries people towards certain outcomes on the discovery of difference, the end result is the same as if you had conver uh, coerced them in the first place. Um, so that's birth. At the end of life, uh, there are at current reckoning over three avoidable deaths per day of people with learning difficulties um, within the NHS. That's from lack of funds, lack of education, lack of care. People with learning disabilities lie on average si die on average 16 years younger than people without. Um, I won't go into why. Again, I can tell you afterwards if you're interested why. We've known about this for 20 years, but government has taken little action. In their report, Death by Indifference, Menkap alleged that the NHS was responsible for institutional discrimination. Three examples close to me. Connor Sparrowhawk, a young man with a learning disability, died of an epileptic seizure while bathing unsupervised in an NHS hospital in 2013. A subsequent review found that there was a widespread failure to investigate and learn from his death at the Southern Health NHS Foundation Trust, where he'd been receiving care. The inquest of Richard Handley, a young man with Down syndrome, found gross and very significant failures at almost every stage of his care. The coroner, Peter Dean, wrote that the multiple omissions of care created an extreme and tragic situation that led to a death from constipation. His abdomen was, one doctor noted, the size of that of a woman who was 40 weeks pregnant. Most recently, Oliver McGowan, 18, from Bristol, was being treated for a seizure at the city's Southmead Hospital in 2016 when he was given olanzapine to sedate him, a drug to which he had a known intolerance and to which, uh, for which both he and his parents requested repeatedly that he was not given. The Learning Disabilities Mortality Review, the LADA program, was established in 2015 to learn from cases like these. When it um, uh, released its second annual report in May 2018, um, there were 1,311 deaths of people with a learning disability be uh, between November 2016 and 2017, but only 103 initial reviews, less than 10% of the target, were completed. Health inequalities for people with disabilities are scandalous and simply not a priority. What happens to us in the middle of life? Well, successive governments have turned the welfare system upside down and just let go. Last November, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Professor Philip Alston, said that the UK government had inflicted great misery on disabled people and other marginalized groups with ministers in a state of denial about the impact of their policies. The previous year, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities told the UK government to make more than 80 improvements to the way its laws and policies affect disabled people's human rights. And in 2016, the same committee said the UK government was guilty of grave and systematic violations of three key sections of the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, most of them caused by ministers at the Department for Work and Pensions. What about education, special education? It's pretty bleak there too, I'm afraid. Permanent, permanent exclusions have increased to 7,720 uh, throughout 2016, 2017. I don't have more recent figures, I'm afraid. Temporary exclusions have gone up to uh, 381,865. 
um, pupils with SEN support at a rate of six times higher than of those without. And all of this is happening in a culture in which media messages about people with disabilities are negative and stigmatizing. In the last month, uh, there was a headline in the Times, pupils lose out as 400,000 pounds is siphoned off into special needs, which is obviously forgetting that people with special needs are pupils and uh, that it benefits everybody. Um, in a culture where costing the state as little as possible has become a moral value, anyone dependent is stigmatized. In her uh, fantastic book, Crippled, commentator Francis Ryan shows how from social care to the benefit system, politicians and media alike have made the case that Britain's 12 million disabled people are a drain on the public purse. She tells the story of a paralyzed man forced to crawl down the stairs because the council wouldn't provide accessible housing, a malnourished woman sleeping in her wheelchair, a young woman with bipolar forced to turn to sex work to survive. Ryan charts how in recent years the public attitude towards disabled people has transformed from compassion to contempt, from society's most vulnerable to benefit cheats. Again, nobody really cares. Uh, I think I will say this because that was quite bleak. We've got, uh, Jess and I have got a zoologist friend who really loves frogs. <laughs> um, yeah, she actually spent six months in the Amazon rainforest trying to work out, as far as we could tell, which of the world's most deadly toads you could safely smoke. <laughs> <laughs> but she loves frogs, and she says that uh, how amphibians are doing is much more important than how uh, the great charismatic animals are doing, lions and pandas and things. Um, she says it's really uh, impossible for them, though, the herpetologists, to get people's attention. She says people are only interested in what she calls cute crack, like sloths and pandas. They want a big head-to-body ratio, big eyes and loads of fur. She and I bond about how we just cannot get attention for the things that really matter. The truth, people, the truth is that we are the fifth rich, richest society in the world. And we can afford to support disabled adults and children and their families in decent living conditions. So why do we swallow this lie so readily? Why do we think independence is all that? I have an actor friend, a genius actor friend, unrelated, he plays a lot of paedophiles. <laughs> I sa he said, the job, uh, Tommy, this is interesting, he said the job of acting is to make, I see the job of acting as making love for that person possible, which I thought was just so amazing. Anyway, he said, what do you dream of for Ollie? I said, I dream uh, that he'll have a house, a wife, a job and a dog. I, I dream he'll be able to live independently. And he said, what? And be like me, he lives alone in a beautiful house in Bloomsbury, full of wonderful art, but he's very, very lonely. What if clown school was onto something? What if it is through our vulnerabilities and failures that we all shine most brightly? Tell you a bit more about Ollie. Ollie doesn't hold a grudge. He remembers everyone's name and birthday. He loves much. He delights in everyone's achievements as if they were his own. He builds community around him wherever he goes. He treats everyone the same and break dances when I buy ice cream. He's taught me how to make people feel valued. He asks me every morning, how did you sleep? Every day when I get in, mum, how was your day? He, he remembers everybody's birthday. He treats everyone the same. We're on hugging terms with our postman. It's not just Ollie. I'm not kidding. Um, uh, we're, uh, we, yeah, we, f we run at each other like old friends, uh, postman and I. His name's Oliver. That's how we got chatting. Um, so I asked team, we call ourselves Team 21, Trisomy 21. It's another name for Down syndrome. I asked some of our friends some of the reasons they love their family members. And here are some of the things they've said. She values everyone equally. What you see is what you get. He loves much, forgives quickly, laughs a lot. She's always ready to wipe your slate clean. His sense of humor, his taste in music, his deep compassion and sensitivity to people, enthusiasm, a positivity, unquestionably the comedy value of Ava's honest reflections on life and her unfiltered questioning of those around her. She's the funniest person I know, sometimes intentionally. For me, it's Hazel's uniqueness, she knows what she wants, and she's nobody's fool. The joy she finds in everything she does. His existence. And my favorite, which was accompanied by a pic picture of a 10-year-old boy dressed as one of the sisters from Frozen, Ted lives in the now. This particular now, he was Anna. <laughs> <laughs> Love Ted. Um, 
I can see people's brows furrow when I tell them particulars of our lives. Sometimes it feels like we are living everyone's worst case scenario. We're living behind a kind of, it feels like a waterfall, like we're separated from people by some rushing water. We're only visible to each other, wobbly and wet. Um, and our lives are harder, as you've heard, but they're also indescribably richer. We have more joy. We have an abundantly varied life. Simon Barnes, I was quite struck, he wrote an article for Mencap, and uh, he said, people envy me, my he's a sports writer for the Times, so he goes to all the you know, finals. He said, people envy me my, my job, they envy me my beautiful wife, they envy me my pile in the country, but they should envy me my Eddie, his son with Down syndrome. Ollie has democratized my life. I lived quite a rarefied life. I went to, uh, my father worked, thank you for coming, Dad. And my father worked for British Airways. We lived abroad in an expat community. I went to boarding school, then I went to Oxford, and then I went into comedy where, you know, it's open to all walks of life, Oxford and Cambridge. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Ollie has uh, given me a, uh, he's taken me through the back of the cupboard into, into Narnia. He's given me access to a whole other world that I find a lot more interesting than Oxford and boarding school and the ambassador's reception. Um, <laughs> Ollie, we had some neighbours move in the bottom of our garden. They, were, they had twins. Um, Ollie wanted to befriend them. I did not want to befriend them. I don't want to know my neighbours at all. No, thanks. I have enough friends. Life is hard enough. Small talk, very bad at small talk. Anyway, Ollie just, uh, the Down syndrome handbook says that people with Down syndrome can't climb very well. Ollie didn't read the, didn't get that memo. He just went over and over and over, over and over. We put like anti-slip paint on, we built the fence higher. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were considering barbed wire, but he would turn out, I'd come down in the morning, 6 a.m., and you would be sat in their garden in just his pants. <laughs> it was so humiliating. It was awful. Just going, oh, so sorry, so sorry. But over time, I came to understand that these people were in fact very nice, they're very understanding. And now in the summer, we put a ladder up over the fence and the kids come and go. Ollie tears down barriers between me and my neighbors. Uh, he's, he's hilarious. He, um, he finds it hard to stop eating. We used to call him the brownie fairy. He used to come down in the night and eat all the brownies. We stopped, stopped making brownies. We, um, we th he then got really into ice cream. He'd come down in the night and eat all the ice cream in the house, so he hid the ice cream. Now he's hit puberty, we're calling him the pornography fairy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But there's a, like, there's a <laughs> silver lining to that too, really. Like when he hit puberty, he ran into my room and went, Mom, look, a bush! I've got a bush! And his brothers, they went to Brighton Pier and they all won these little cuddly toys with tufts, you know, like, and they call them bushes. And, but my other two boys, they're not worried about puberty. You know, he's just taken away the shame there. It's, you know, it's embarrassing, but makes you think, why were we so ashamed of that anyway? I mean, this happens to everyone. What is that social construct that we can't talk about it? He's got a different logic. What do you want to be when you grow up, Ollie? Fat. What? <laughs> Why? Why not fat? No, Ollie, you want to be healthy. No, I want to be fat, because then I'll have eaten a lot of birthday cake. He loves birthday cake, but also he means I'll have had a long and happy life. He's taught me a new kind of comedy. What's a fisherman's name? Dave. <laughs> <laughs> He's taught me that uh, your relationship with each other mat matters a lot more than whether or not the jokes are funny. There's such a deep joy in this, the jokes that only he can tell to only us, his team. They build our community. They're our common language. They tear down barriers. At one stage, it would have taken me half an hour to get all his shoes on him every morning. I don't work out much, but I was doing a lot of resi resistance training at that time, if you know what I mean. We did some really hardcore relating. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The paradox is, of course, that we are so much closer for that. We are soldered together. Our love bonds have been forged in the fire. It's humiliating being the parent of somebody with special needs. I've got a social worker who I need. <laughs> uh, we are on first name terms with lots and lots of policemen. All my neighbors have seen me running down the street in my pants and my 
I am a crazy bitch t-shirt that was given to me by a Danish uh, fashion designer, <laughs> which uh, a gift I only wear in bed. Um, but you know what, the, the value in this that's so hard to explain to other people makes sense to me, perfect sense to me, that this should be more precious, partly because of clown school and partly because of my faith. Clown school teaches that accepting your own ridiculousness is a sort of glorious freedom. And my faith teaches me that when I am weak, then I am strong. As um, St. Therese of Lisieux said, when I know I fail, I, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. When she says, when you, it's the, she calls it the little way, like where you know you're, you're failing in all areas, actually. So the areas where you know you're failing and repent and ask for help are paradoxically the areas in which you are strongest. Now, I meant at this point to talk about mythos and logos, because I want to say that we lack the language to talk about these things to each other. Um, but unfortunately, I just haven't done the research. <laughs> 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 so you could maybe deal with that later, Elizabeth. But I mean, it's my understanding. <laughs> it's my understanding that uh, logos is a sort of the rational data, analytical sort of scientific left hemisphere. Is that right? Left hemisphere type of language. And that mythos is not that. <laughs> And <laughs> it's on the right side of your brain, okay? And uh, these experiences are better described, really. The value of these experiences are better described with this right hemisphere spiritual language. Um, and Elizabeth, you can talk about Ian McGilchrist because I just would be, excuse my language, bullshitting. So I'm not going to talk about that. So I, the, the point is that um, uh, this academic that Elizabeth knows believes that our brains um, prioritize the left, the left type of language. We see that that's more compelling. And I believe that our society is losing the ability or has been going through a period of losing the ability to communicate with the right hemisphere, with art, with culture, with passion, with spirit. And I think the and, and that's partly to do with not having faith in the public arena. And I think the dismissal of this has had really quite a catastrophic effect on public discourse. I'm going to come back to that later. Um, so we find in disability world that people totally dismiss our testimony. We tell them that our lives are good and they say that's not true. They don't believe us. Or they don't hear us. They tell us that we're lying. Um, to force women to have babies. They say it must be an adaptive coping strategy, false consciousness. People just can't imagine that what we're saying is true. Or if they do imagine lives of people with disabilities, they imagine them in a bad way. They don't look at the evidence. They don't hear the testimony. To us, it feels like we are being gaslit by the government. Why are people so resistant? There's a fundamental dominant idea that pain is to be avoided at all costs and that therefore disability must be crap. We have a deeply rooted cultural belief that the point of our lives is what we are capable of doing. Life we think is about contribution, it's about our achievements, our jobs, having a partner or a family. We are slaves to the cost benefit analysis in all things because the prevailing political language of our age is utilitarianism. Another thing about which I know very little. <laughs> this is what I understand and I'm sure I can be corrected. Utilitarianism was a philosophy. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was introduced by someone who appears to be quite a strange man called Jeremy Bentham, who loved measuring things, particularly consequences. And he thought that you could calculate happiness. As some of you may know, his desiccated body now sits at UCL, quite nearby, offering amusement and disgust to generations of students. Bentham reckoned that you could make your moral decisions based on how many people could be made happy by the result. If 19 people were made happy by course of action A and 18 by course of action B, then you should choose action A. So from where I'm standing, you only have to look at Brexit and Trump to see the flaw in that argument. The takeover by stealth of utilitarian thinking means that we're now a people that thinks the idea of society having winners and losers is inevitable. We measure everything from the number of steps we take to the length of our sleep and how many seven-year-olds in the country can spell the word turnip. As a result, we are losing the ability to talk about things that can't be measured, 
And if the world is governed according to the edict, what gets measured get, gets done, we may be neglecting some of the most important things about being human, like love. So um, here it's Theos. You're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, well, I'm not a utilitarian. But even if you're not a utilitarian, just have a quick think about what you mean by justice. With justice, you normally think uh, of fairness, getting back what you put in. It's unjust not to be paid what you're worth. I'm just thinking of Samira Ahmed here, BBC Gender Pay Gap. And in a way, um, some forms of Christianity, certainly the ones that I have been involved in, I think contribute to this too. Um, the low Anglican tradition I've, I love dearly um, teaches a transactional salvation. We're distinguished from animals by virtue of our consciousness, self-reflection, moral capacity, and indeed that act of repentance. Um, I don't have I literally no idea uh, whether that's right or wrong, but it does appear to be a kind of cost-benefit, quid pro quo. If the point of our lives is what we're capable of doing, then the implication must be that a human life lacking in the capacity for purposive action will be worthless kind of pointless. But those of us in disability world completely disagree with you. Our insider experience tells us differently. Um, in the Down syndrome community, we have been uh, campaigning hard to say that we are not so different from other people. We do the same things. We say we can achieve purposive action. Tommy can act Hamlet. We can do jobs. We can get married. And we say, why should we have to justify our children's lives? Because we are so similar to you. There's loads and loads of parent testimony books um, that really the sheer number of them, this number of them express this deep frustration that, um, that we're, you were trying to get across this message. However, I was speaking a couple of weeks ago at a conference for uh, parents and caregivers to people with profound and multiple learning disabilities who our mode of... Um, advocating has slightly annoyed and they say exactly the same things as us really but um, they are not they can't argue on purposive action they say just like you we don't want to be repeatedly asked in hospital if we want our family members resuscitated we don't want to have to justify our family members existence every time we meet a doctor don't please slap a do not resuscitate notice on the end of our beds without asking. We say that people with PMLD's lives matter. We want to tell you that. Um, you look at us as if we're insane, but we think that the criteria of whether or not we are humans should not be something that someone other than us gets to debate. They say the lives of our loved ones are valuable in and of themselves. Life is valuable in and of itself. Its goodness is not dependent on what can be achieved within it. Just because you can't see the value doesn't mean it isn't there. And I think this is a you know, profound challenge to all of us inside and outside of the church. Uh, my feeling is that Ollie has been a spiritual guide for me. He has given me freedom from societal standards that were completely, it turned out, bogus. Why should not people further along that capacity line, excuse my technical language, um, people with fewer obvious capacities, why should they not be further along that spiritual chain? What if our lives, the meaning of our lives, is nothing to do with what we do at all? And it's all to do with surrender and acceptance and being peaceful in relationship and, and love. Our feeling in disability world is that pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain are not the routes to a deep, relational and meaningful life. We sense that people are asking for a black and white answer from us. Is it better or worse? Is it? Is it though? Is it? Is it good or bad? Is it though? Is it? We are moved into a space where we are living from a both and understanding. And I think that that is best uh, summed up, in fact, by the cross, 
by the emblem of the cross. And I wish it was more socially acceptable to talk about the cross <laughs> because it, it, would, it really does explain where we find ourselves. The emblem of, of the cross, that moment of crucifixion, which is within the tradition of Christianity, but I believe useful outside it, the highest and the lowest moment for humanity at the same time. It is a descent and an ascent. Um, as with most deep truths, it's perhaps more useful to us as a symbol than it is as, as literal truth, as history. As history, it's just, you know, it's something that happened. But as a symbol, it really is a key to understanding a meaningful life, I believe. Jesus hangs between a good thief and a bad one, between life and death, between divinity and mortality, a feminine soul and a masculine body, saying, okay, it's complicated and simple. <laughs> we can get through it. Let me lead you to the rock that is higher. I don't want to glorify suffering. I can see that it looks unrealistic to say that meaningful lives can coexist with challenge and suffering. But I think um, that it's at this point that the truly beautiful flows. I'm going to, I think I'm just going to suddenly stop. But I want to end with one, <laughs> I mean, I've got pages and pages, you know what, my, um, but I would wanted to say one more thing about our lives may not make sense, but another uh, story in the Gospels that has really touched me and I think gives a good answer to what Jesus thought of utilitarianism is the moment when he went to Simon's house and he was not welcomed, um, particularly. He was not, his feet were not washed. And he sat down and he was speaking, and a woman, we believe Mary Magdalene, came in with a jar, a very valuable alabaster jar of perfume. And she began to weep, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. And he she broke that alabaster jar of perfume, which was all she had in the world, and uh, very valuable, and she anointed him. And Judas, who was standing there, told Jesus off, and he said, what a waste, something along the lines of, what a waste. We could have sold that and we could have used the money for the poor. And Jesus says something along the lines of, don't scold her. What she's done is beautiful. It is beautiful and it will always be remembered. And I suppose I just want to encourage you to develop in yourselves that other way of seeing that can recognize this great beauty and explain it to others. Because I really think that this is a key to freedom for us from this small, stats-ridden, winner-loser world we've, we're currently living in. Culture. Thanks.